You know, the New Testament uh, writers <clears throat> referred to and quoted extensively from the Old Testament. One estimate I read was 77 such references, quotes and, and references. But well, there's one verse that's quoted more than any other, and that is Psalm 110 and verse 1. When you add in uh, Psalm 110 verse 4, which is also quoted, this, this psalm is by far the most referenced psalm in the New Testament. So why did Psalm 110 receive so much attention from Jesus, Peter, and Paul? Today we're going to take a look at Psalm 110. So you might turn over to that. The psalm was written by David. And if you do have titles in your Bible, not all Bibles have them, but uh, these, these titles are in the uh, original manuscripts. And uh, so we know from uh, three witnesses that David wrote this psalm, the first being the title of the psalm, which says, A Psalm of David. The second witness is Jesus himself, who, when he quoted it in Matthew 22, we'll turn to that later, so you don't need to worry about that now, specifically said it was written by David. And the third witness was Peter in Acts 2, who said the same thing. So we know that this psalm was one written by David. It is almost universally recognized as a psalm about the Messiah and reveals a lot of information about him that we would not otherwise know. So as I said, the most often quoted verse is verse 1, and we'll read that now. It says, The Eternal said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is a remarkable verse in many ways. We know that Jesus was God, and at times interacted with Israel in that capacity. But some think of him as the only God of the Old Testament, ignoring the active role of the Father. This verse clearly identifies Yahweh, Yehovah, the Eternal, as the Father. And he is speaking to another entity that David identifies as my Lord, or Adonai. So it is a clear reference to more than one being in the Godhead, the preeminent role of the Father, and the preexistence of Jesus. Now Jesus quoted this psalm himself in Matthew 22, as I said earlier. We'll turn over there now, Matthew 22. There are parallel passages in Mark 12 and Luke 20, but we will be primarily in Matthew 22. And I'm going to start reading in verse 15 to set the context under which he gave this, qu quoted this psalm. And in verse 15 it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? They knew they had it. If he said no, that they didn't have to pay taxes, they could accuse him to the Romans of plotting rebellion. If he said yes, they could accuse him to the Jews of being a Roman sympathizer. His answer, of course, was brilliant. The tax money has Caesar's image on it. And in verse 21, he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Their attempt to trick him had failed. But in verse 23, the Sadducees stepped up. So the same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question about this resurrection they didn't believe in. 
saying in verse 24, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. I figured he couldn't answer this question. The Sadducees were trying to point out how possible the idea of a resurrection was. Jesus gave them an answer, but since the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, it was really wasted on them. But he doesn't, Jesus doesn't let this go. He continues to talk to them in verse 31. says, but concerning the resurrection, which you don't believe in, resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, and in verse, in uh, Mark 12, 26, it reads a little bit differently and gives us more information. I'll read that to you. You don't have to turn there, but it says, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, and now in verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Why did Jesus pick out this verse from Exodus instead of citing Job or Daniel or Ecclesiastes, which have much clearer verses on the resurrection? It was because in addition to the refusal to believe in a resurrection, they also did not accept any of the Old Testament as valid for proving doctrine outside of the five books of Moses. So Jesus proves the resurrection from Moses. He also was not referring exclusively to himself as being the God of the living. We're going to come back here to Matthew 22, but if you turn briefly over to Acts 3. Acts 3, we'll see what uh, Peter had to say here in verse 13, where he's, he uh, refers as well, uh, the same way that Jesus did, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he calls him the God of our fathers, and says that he glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So this is another ind indirect reference to the involvement of the Father, the God of the patriarchs, described in Psalm 110. Back to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, and this time verse 34. When the Sad Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, they decided to make another attempt at this, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now they were expecting that he might be able, they might be able to catch him in elevating one of the Ten Commandments over the others. But in verse 37, Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments saying all the law and the prophets. No comment to his, Jesus' answer is recorded in Matthew, but in Mark we are told that the scribe who asked the question acknowledged that this answer was better than any other that he could have made. But having answered all of their questions authoritatively, without giving them anything to pick at, Jesus now asks them a question. And we read this in verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How then does David, in the Spirit, Call him Lord, saying, in verse 44, The Eternal said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then he comments on that by saying, If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And so no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. 
Questions that they asked got answered. Questions that he asked confounded them. The Jews of that day fully acknowledged that this psalm was speaking of the Messiah. Jesus was pointing out the pre-existence of the Messiah and his superiority over David. They had no answer to his question, and he proceeded to tell the multitudes that they should not follow the example of the Pharisees, who were fools and hypocrites, and who were the enemies that would be made his footstool. That's the main content of the next chapter. This, of course, did not make any friends with the Jewish leaders, and two days later they arrested him and dragged him before the high priest. If you turn a few chapters ahead to Matthew 26, Matthew 26 and verse 62, we read that the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? In uh, verse 63, Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. In verse 64, Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, as I say to you, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. This image of the Messiah sitting at the right hand of the Father, the position of authority and trust, comes directly from Psalm 110 and verse 1. This is the only place in the Old Testament where such a reference is made. Jesus is again referring to that verse he had confounded them with two days earlier, and this time making it clear that he was claiming to be the fulfillment of that messianic prophecy. After his resurrection, he appeared to many over the next 40 days. And then, as it says in Mark 16, 19, so then after the Lord had spoken to him, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So in Matthew 16, 19, we have a direct reference by Mark to the fulfillment of Psalm 110 and verse 1. Ten days later was Pentecost. And after the Holy Spirit was conferred on the disciples, Peter called, talked to the crowd that witnessed this event. And in Acts 2, Acts 2 and verse 29. Acts 2, 29, Paul, uh, Peter says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you, have now, which you now see and hear. Referring to the giving of the Holy Spirit at that time. And in verse 34, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So Peter now quotes, here quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, to explicitly state that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah and was now sitting at the right hand of God. There are several other verses that refer to Jesus at the right hand of God, including Hebrews 12, 2 and 1 Peter 3, 22. I'm not going to turn there, but those were Hebrews 12, 2 and 1 Peter 3, 22, in case you're trying to write them down. 
But I would like to turn to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 and verse 20. In Ephesians 1 and verse 20, it says, Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So once again, a reference to that passage about being seated at his right hand. In verse 21, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And then in verse 22, he says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now, this was probably actually a quote from Psalm 8, which has words closer to what is said here. But the concept of putting things under his feet, including his enemies, is expressed here. Paul did not ignore the more specific phrasing of the Psalm 110. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 25, 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, and in verse 25 it says, For he must reign, meaning Jesus, till he has put all enemies, meaning the Father, under his feet. So that's more of a direct reference to Psalm 110. The book of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 110 extensively, and we're going to read many of those passages now. We're going to start in chapter 1 of Hebrews. Hebrews 1. And right off the bat, in verse 3, Paul says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Many Old Testament quotes follow, but in verse 13, he adds this one, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Once again, directly quoting the words of Psalm 110 and verse 1. But this isn't the last reference to this verse in Hebrews. If we turn over to chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 12. We read, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. If we go back now to Psalm 110 itself, we'll read a little bit more of what this psalm has to say now that we've explored verse 1, 110, and we'll continue with verse 2, which says, The Eternal shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. This passage is somewhat reminiscent of Psalm 2. We recently had a message from Victor Howe on Psalm 2, which is very much a messianic psalm and also quoted quite a bit in the New Testament, but in Psalm 2, we're going to read verse 7, starting in verse 7, where it says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession, you shall break them, and break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So that's uh, one possible reference uh, that is being made by, by David in the Psalm 110, where he said, The Eternal shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, and, uh, and also a command to rule in the midst of your enemies. But I'd also like to suggest that Isaiah 
is another way to look at this particular verse. Isaiah 2 and verse 3, this will sound familiar to most of you, it says, Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Eternal, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Eternal from Jerusalem. So I would like to suggest that when Psalm 110 verse 2 says the Eternal shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, that it could also apply to the fact that the law will go forth. And from <clears throat> by the law going forth, he will be able to rule in the midst of his enemies. Psalm 110 again, this time verse 3. Psalm 110, verse 3, it says, Your people shall be volunteers. The authorized version, the Old King James says, They shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you shall have the dew of your youth. Who is this referring to? Well, one possibility is referring to the church. We are his people. We are volunteers, hopefully we are willing volunteers, and we help him out in whatever way he asks us to, whether it be witnessing, whether it be praying, whether it be developing godly character, whatever he requires of us. Um, but it also could be referring to the fact that at some point people need to be willing to obey God before he will grant them eternal life. God is not making automatons. And his greatest work is giving us free moral agency and then developing righteous character in us and making us actually willing to obey him. In verse 4 of Psalm 110, we read this other verse that has quite a bit of attention in the New Testament. And it says, The Eternal has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is only mentioned one other time in the Old Testament. It's where he is introduced. We'll find that in Genesis 14, and I'd like to go back there because we need to find out what it actually says about him. Genesis 14 and verse 18. Genesis 14, 18 says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, uh, Abram, gave him a tithe of all. As we will see, this Melchizedek was the pre-incarnate Christ, acting even then as the high priest for the Father, who was the one who delivered Abram's enemies into his hand. And we can read more about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 5, Paul uh, first mentions him. Hebrews 5, and we'll start in verse 5. Hebrews 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, the Father, who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you, which is a quote that we just read from Psalm 2. But then in verse 6 he continues and says, as he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Quoting, of course, from Psalm 110. 
In verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, Paul then continues to tell them about their dull hearing and how he was having difficulty leaving the elementary principles of Christ in verse 1 of chapter 6. But by the end of the chapter, he appears to return to what he was hoping to get to. And in verse 19, Hebrews 6, he says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And we continue in chapter 7, which is one of those unfortunate chapter breaks, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, that's the meaning of Melchizedek, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, by description, meaning king of peace, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, if Melchizedek, which perhaps Paul had some insight that we weren't given, but he claims, Melchizedek did not have a father or mother. He had neither beginning of days nor end of life. He was made like the Son of God, and he remains a priest continually. There's no other person this could be except pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. If this Melchizedek was still a priest continually, there would be absolutely no reason or even possibility for Jesus Christ to take over that role. So Jesus was merely assuming the same role that he had throughout eternity. In verse 4, we continue with Paul's discussion of Melchizedek, and it says, Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes and paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So his argument is that this man, Jesus, who assumed the role of Melchizedek and was indeed Melchizedek in the Old Testament, was greater than the Levites because he received tithes effectively from them and uh, was, was a high priest even though he was not of the tribe of of Levi. But he continues, he says, therefore, in verse 11, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the priest people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he whom these things are spoken he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident in verse 14 that our Lord arose from Judah. 
of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Once again, he quotes this verse, which he's been dwelling on. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become pre for they they, referring to the Levites, have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, and once again he goes back to quote the verse, but he adds the first phrase which says, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So here he's making the point that God appointed Jesus to be the high priest by an oath, not just from inheritance. Then verse 23 adds another argument. He says, also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the utmost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he's referring then to the fact that it had said several times, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but by the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son, who has been perfected forever. We should probably continue with the Psalm 110 and f finish it up here. We have a couple of minutes. Psalm 110. If we read uh, verse 5, we read another reference to the right hand, where it says, Psalm 110, verse 5, The Lord at your right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. This is undoubtedly a reference to the day of the Lord, and as we read in Revelation 6, the day of the wrath of the Lamb. Um, verse 6, it says, He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. We know in John 5, verse 22, that the Father judges no one, Jesus said, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So here we have another reference to Jesus as in his role as the Messiah, judging among the heathen. And then the psalm finishes up by saying, He shall drink of the brook by the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. Referring to his final victory and the victory that we will receive through his uh, high priest role and, and, and his kingship. Psalm 110 gives us some unique insights into the nature of God. Actively involved in his plan and the Messiah is both king and high priest sitting at the right hand of God the Father to intercede on our behalf as he prepares to rule over his enemies. It gives us hope in the victory of Jesus over his and our enemies, including death, and points out our role as willing participants in his kingdom.